Dunkirk by Laura Curtis. 29th May 1940. Dear Diary, I had thought I was going to choke to death from the damp sand clogging my throat or the blood that I feared was going to erupt inside my battered body. Yet, here I am, on a boat in the middle of the English Channel, sailing for home, and against all hope, I am alive. Dunkirk, Operation Dynamo, as the skipper hurriedly told me as he grabbed my arm and hauled me aboard his fishing boat, was a brainchild of our new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. I count my lucky stars that he was chosen. I believed him when he warned us about that tyrant. Hitler's the reason we were trapped on that beach in the first place, stranded and alone, just waiting to be attacked by the advancing German army. It was the drone of the planes flying overhead that froze my heart. They were a constant threat. Their shadows cast black shapes over the 400,000 men that surrounded me in all directions. We all cowered, of course we did, as we were all fully aware that we were open targets. Despite the hero heroic efforts of the brave Royal Air Force pilots, we knew that we may be picked off like rats at any moment by the incessant gunfire. Call it fate, call it destiny, call it my guardian angel protecting me. But something, something decided that the bullet was going to hit Albert and not me. I tried to catch him as he fell into the sodden sand next to me. He was murmuring my name. My hands trembled. I unbuttoned, unbuttoned his jacket buttons to reveal a puddle of blood where his heart was once beating. Flooded with heartbreak, I let my tears fall. I couldn't help it. He was my friend. I only had one consolation. Maybe his world was now better than mine. As I write this now, safe on this boat, I wonder if they collected his body or if it still lies there, alone on the beach, lapping gently by the incoming blood-infused waves. I can feel his dog tags in my pocket. They are still there, tucked safely inside, and I'll return them to Mary for him, I promised. Somehow, I am alive. Perhaps he died so that I could live. It was the fearful anticipation of our imminent death that was most exhausting, you know, unknowing if we were to be saved or not. And we were so young. We had been there for days, my brave comrades and I, gazing at the stars in the sky and watching as the sun issued forth the promise and hope of a new day amid the prospect of breathing our last breaths, waiting just wait him. Fearing for our lives, we had fled from the town to the beach, only to realise that there was to be no escape. There were too few destroyers. Many had been bombed. The shore was too shallow, and those that remained had, remained had to navigate through the debris of wreckage. The mole was almost inaccessible. All I could see was sand. Miles and miles of desolate, bleak, wind-swept sand. As for the sea, the sea stretched on and on like a never-ending, torturous reminder of a home that was so near, yet so far away. It led the way to safety, but we knew that if we were to set foot into the grey nothingness, we would be stepping into danger. We would surely be swept to our death. We must have looked a pitiful sight. All of us were waiting, waiting like rabbits, among, rabbits amongst the dunes, quiet, except for the cries of the wounded. Some of us wore oil-clogged rags that had once been a respected allied uniform. Others wore helmets that had been pierced by enemy fire. However, until we were lying face down in that sand, we still had one last weapon left. Hope. It was then that our faith and hope became realised. Even nature seemed to have heard our plea for after days of sun and just as the German troops were advancing nearer, a fog rolled in. That is how hope and faith and nature and human spirit all linked hands to make the impossible possible. By some sheer miracle or stroke of brilliance, they came for us, shrouded by the cloak of mist. They came sailing. At first, they were tiny pinpricks in the distance, 
but they approached closer and closer. A flotilla of little ships had sailed to us. Civilian pleasure boats, big cruisers which had space for 20 men and tiny fishing boats with only space for a handful. They came. They heard the call on the wireless and without hesitation, knowing that at any moment they could be dive-bombed by the merciless Luftwaffe, they sailed to our rescue. Stepping into the shadow, shallows, it was with utter joy and relief that I clambered aboard. The fisherman, the fisherman hauled me up and in, and I simply sank, sank down as exhaustion overwhelmed my body. With a sympathetic smile, he silently handed me a warm, comforting cup of tea and a chunk of bread. He only said a few words to me before he reached for the wheel. Hold on to that Dunkirk spirit, matey. Hold on. Regretfully, I've just realised I don't even know his name. Yet, he risked his life to save mine. Dunkirk was a true story of, her of heroic selflessness and bravery, courage and resilience in the face of terrible adversity. And survival against all the odds has been a day when hope triumphed over evil. For as long as this war lasts, we shall never surrender. The enemy believed that they could defeat us. However, here I am, on a boat, in the middle of the English Channel, sailing for home. Activity 1. Skim and scan. OK, everyone, you should be used to this now. Skim your text and scan for the first letter of each word. Highlight it when you find it. If you're not sure which what one of the words means, please look it up in a dictionary. Also, if there are any other words in the text you're not sure of, do the same with those two, please. Pause the video until you've completed this. Once you have found each word, check that you understand the meaning of it. Use a dictionary, as I've just mentioned. So now you're on to answering the questions. Remember, we are focusing on the content domain inference. You need to read between the lines and dig a bit deeper for some of the answers. Use your text and your question sheets to answer the questions. Good luck.